world has changed. Everyone can sense it. The hairs on their neck begin to stand on end. The skies darken, and a storm can be seen brewing on the horizon, creeping ever closer. A green light crackling across the stars. Doom has come to Azeroth. Don't forget to like and subscribe, but maybe avoid the fire in today's episode. It began with the relentless marching of innumerable demons into the world. The portals now opened by the Highborn allowed them entry. They began to pour from the palace grounds, striking at the heart of the Calderai Empire. Taken completely by surprise, the Night Elven defences crumbled, their people falling too quickly to mount any sort of resistance. The loss of life in those first days was unimaginable. The once glorious Lunar Kingdom was burning from within. But from the smoke and ash, heroes would rise. It was Malfurion and Taronda who first rallied their people, and they would mount the resistance. But it only bought them enough time to flee the destruction. Malfurion, however, would reach out to his brother, Illidan. Illidan was himself a highborn. He was as enraptured with the magic as any other, if not more so. Although he saw the wisdom and truth in his brother's words, he would join the resistance forces. Striking at the demons seemed pointless. Each one felled seemed to replenish itself within mere days. It was then that Malfurion sought the wisdom of his old teacher, Cenarius. Cenarius had been grazing with the bull-like Yongol in central Kalimdor. Some had migrated back north after being freed from the slavery of the Mogu. From here on out, they would call themselves the Tauren, as they rediscovered their druidic ancestry. Cenarius leaped into action. He would hold court with the other wild gods, keeping them abreast of the situation as it began unfolding. They were not so accustomed to working together. Most sought solitude in the wild places of the world, but they trusted the wisdom of Cenarius and pledged themselves to the fight. Even the dragon aspects had become aware of what was taking place. As the protectors of the world, they gathered their respective flight, leaving their home on the Dragon Isles and flying to war. Meanwhile, the Night Elven forces themselves began to fight relentlessly for their homeland. They would not go down without a fight, but inch by inch they lost ground. Malfurion had an idea. He believed the only real way to stop the invasion was to destroy the Well of Eternity itself, so that no more portals could be opened with its power. While all Night Elves were appalled by the idea, most saw the truth in his words and agreed. Illidan, however, did not. Still feeling rejected by Tyrande when she chose his brother and suffering the agonizing pains of addiction, the arcane magic had given him. He would choose his own path. He rallied with the elite sorcerers of the Moon Guard. They were currently under the command of Latosius, a powerful and ancient mage. But he fell in battle, and Illidan was then given command. It was in this engagement he truly learned what sacrifice meant. As he fought back the demons, instead of utilizing the Moon Guard mages, he instead would have them channel their power into him. They were defenseless, and would be cut down one by one as Illidan used their magic to repel the forces. He saw a purity in the magic of the demons. He was intrigued by it. All races would contend with the destruction of the demons as they continued to pour outward. Not only the elves were at risk now, all would fight for survival. Even the savage centaur tribes were helpless to resist as their people began to be slaughtered. But one warrior of their people would hold his ground. His name was Maruk. He would slaughter a demon host a thousand strong to safeguard his people. 
cementing himself as legend in their kind. But it took his toll upon his body, and he limped back wounded. The other tribe leaders saw the fame he had garnered as a threat, and plotted to kill him while he was wounded. But his mate Tira would learn of the plot and slay the assassins, and the tribe leaders in retaliation. The wild god Onara saw the plight of the centaurs, and would not lose them to the savagery of the demons, and so she guided them on the winds to a new home, one in which they would share with the green blight in the now named Onaran Plains of the Dragon Isles. As the wild gods reached the front lines, their power was undeniable. They began to turn the tides of this war. The dragons assaulted from the skies while the ground forces marched ever onward. Every step was a hard-fought battle, but they were winning. That is, until the army of demons refocused their attacks, now upon the demigods themselves. In what felt like an instant, the mighty gods of nature were overwhelmed. The leader of the night elven forces, Jared Shadowsong, did all he could to aid them, but it was not enough. Even a force of Tauren, led by Holm High Mountain, joined the fray. He was relentless and slayed many of the demons, even earning the blessing of the great stag Malorn, bearing his antlers forevermore as a sign of their kinship. But it was not enough. Cenarius himself was surrounded, but one of the most powerful and ancient of the wild gods, Malorn, charged into the fray, buying the wounded Cenarius time to escape. But there he stood to face the demigod, Archimond of the once benevolent Eridar people. In a battle that shook the foundations of the world, he would eventually snap the neck of the great stag. Malfurion, now incensed by this act, used his magic to draw strangling roots and vines around the legion general, forcing his retreat. His era of the green flight would be saddened by the loss of Malorn, and she and her children would take Cenarius to the Emerald Dream to recuperate. He would sit out the rest of this terrible war, much to his chagrin, but the rest still battled endlessly. To give up now would mean annihilation. Too much was at stake. Meanwhile, Xavius sought a way to serve his master, and to do it, he would reach out to Illidan's mind. He would bring the doubts he was already having to the surface, to turn him against his brother. If he had no rival, then Tyrande would be his. But it was around this time that Illidan killed a powerful doom guard and claimed the weapons as his own. They would forevermore be known as the War Glives of Azanoth. The war began to take its toll. Even the Aspect's power no longer felt sufficient, and the resistance was growing desperate. It was Neltharion who came forward and counseled the other dragons. He had a plan to win this war once and for all. Long had the Aspects trusted his wisdom. They did not know of the darkness in his heart that had been festering. He proposed they create a magical device born from his endless experiments named a Dragon Soul. Into this, each of the flights would pour a portion of their aspectral power. This was actually a design of the old gods, crafted by a group of goblin artificers that obeyed his every word. These goblins were an interesting race. Long ago, the Keeper Mimiron found a substance named Kajamite. After feeding it to one of the races that wandered the grounds, they suddenly became hyper-intelligent, and their skin would take on the self-same green hue as the ore. If they stopped ingesting the ore, however, in short time, they would revert back to their primitive state. Nothing could withstand the power of the five flights combined, he assured them. It was agreed that they would heed his words and one fateful day the Dragon Souls was created. In secret, however, he had told his own flight to withhold the power of the Black Aspect. He did not tell them why, and as was expected, 
his flight obeyed his every command. The dragons took to the skies once more and entered the fray, with Nelfarion leading the charge. He unleashed the weapon on the demons to devastating effect. It wiped out entire legions in an instant. It worked, they thought, as the dragons and the mortal defenders rejoiced. That was until the cheering became screams. In his madness, Neltharion turned the weapon not only against the demons, but the mortals too. When the other flights tried to stop him, he would turn it even against his own kin. The magic contained within was their own. They were paralyzed and powerless to do anything to stop him. That is, with the exception of one brave red dragon, Coriolstras. He managed to distract Neltharion and free the dragons from its grasp so they could counterattack. Neltharion, who would now go under the name Deathwing, proclaimed himself the ruler of Azeroth. All were welcome to bow to him or be destroyed by the device, now called a demon soul for its heinous acts. Outraged by this, his once closest friend Maligos struck first. Rallying his flight, he charged against the destroyer. Unleashing the full power of the soul, it burned through Maligos and his entire flight. Almost every blue dragon was killed in an instant. While Maligos himself would survive, his mate and the bulk of his flight would not be so lucky. They were brought to the edge of extinction in mere seconds. While the other dragons did attempt to stop him, it was in vain. Deathwing would take his forces and retreat, while the other flights, now broken, would leave and go into hiding. With heavy hearts, they left the mortal defenders to fight the demons that remained alone. The violence had only just begun, and the world and its inhabitants have only seen the beginning of devastation. But let's leave the rest till the next episode. Thanks so much to everyone for every single bit of support. And until next time, don't forget to come back. Anytime. <laughs>